control execution overnight in Alabama. A convicted cop killer stopped eating his final meal after he thought his life would be spared, but then a reversal by the Supreme Court allowed his execution to move forward. Overnight, Alabama's executioner putting Nathaniel Woods to death, capping an end to a whirlwind final days for the convicted cop killer and his supporters. A jury found Woods guilty in the 2004 killing of three Birmingham police officers. And although the prosecutor said Woods was not the gunman and Woods' convicted accomplice said he alone killed officers, Woods was found guilty on capital murder charges. And the fact that folks think as a result of the fact that Nathaniel Woods was not the shooter, that somehow that that's been an objection I found very difficult to process as a prosecutor. After exhausting all options, Woods said his final goodbye to his family Thursday afternoon. But in the minutes leading up to his execution, and just as he was eating his final meal, the Supreme Court issued a temporary stay, putting a pause on the execution. His advocates celebrated, including Martin Luther King III, who tweeted, Amazing news. Great work, everyone. But then, a stunning reversal. The Supreme Court lifted the temporary stay, allowing the state's executioner to move forward. In a statement this morning, Woods' family says they'll continue fighting to clear Woods' name, saying he's an innocent man and that will always be the truth. We are not giving up. The state's attorney general, however, insists justice was served. Tonight, Nathaniel Woods, one of two cop killers in the bloodiest day in Birmingham Police Department history, has met his just fate. The daughter of one of the police officers also fought the execution. The Supreme Court did not explain his decision. And that's just it. The Supreme Court, whether we like it or not, don't really have to explain why they did what they did. The following video may contain thoughts, views, and opinions that some of you guys may find triggering and or offensive, but my opinion is just my opinion. I done been to jail. I did 18 months. I got sentenced to two years, but they got, you know, in federal, you only do the most of your time. And I was with my cousins when they robbed a bank without me knowing. I was in the back seat and my cousin lied and said he was going to get out the car to go take a leak behind a dumpster somewhere. And the guy driving let him out and he took off to go take a piss. Came back, he was sweating his ass off, and he had his socks was on his hands like mittens, and he peeled off. And before I knew it, they robbed the bank and took me on a joy ride without me knowing. And um, long story short, only got two years because him and the white dude who was driving both confessed that I had nothing to do with it. But since I was in the back seat, I was an accessory after the fact. They didn't give me an accessory to the robbery. I got, a, I got an accessory after the fact. However, if the bank sounded the alarm and it became a car chase and an officer was harmed in the process of chasing us in New Orleans, in the state of Louisiana, it, now imagine, this, this took place when I was uh, 19. I'm 45 years old now. But um, people, people got to understand something, man, that when you're committing a crime, even if you are not the trigger person, if you are a part of the group committing that crime, it's like the gang injunction law. All of you guys are going to get that same charge. A lot of young men, I think the Central Park Five was convicted in that same um in that same um situation where even other guys hey, you know, said, look here, this dude wasn't part of it. He didn't have nothing to do with it. Well, he was still there and we're going to make him part of it. He's going to also go to jail, jail with y'all. That can happen. The thing that saved me was that I didn't get any of the money, and the dude and my cousin both admitted to the detectives he didn't get the money. So I got the least amount of time. They both got they both got twelve years. I got two years. But but my lawyer was an old 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 white man, and he was friends with the judge. In fact, my lawyer was my judge's professor at Tulane, I think. So they kind of you know how the old people are. They know everybody in court. So he was just doing this shit, not really pro bono, but at you know super super sliding scale price. I don't know the ins and outs of this case of Nathaniel Woods' execution, but the point that I'm making is this. I was seeing this guy's mugshot all over Facebook. One of my friends tagged me, T.O.J., what do you think? I looked at the, at the, at the um, facts of the case, and unfortunately, you know, I, I'm looking right at this. 
Alabama Governor Kay Ivey refused to step in and stop the lethal injection. This is the same governor who had blackface. So you think she was going <laughs> to, she apologized for having blackface on in college. You think this, this governor right here is going to um, apologize? I mean, I'm sorry, is going to actually stop lethal, lethal injection of, of a convicted cop killer? Even though he wasn't a trigger man, according to all the, the facts of the case, he was kind of in on it. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I need young people especially to understand that. If you with somebody and they commit a crime, even though you are not the trigger person, you go to jail. You get the exact same thing as everybody else. The only, only, only thing that saved me was that we didn't kill nobody. Okay, and it wasn't a, it wasn't police, and more importantly, we wasn't charged with a capital crime. I don't know who the fuck this dude defense attorney was, because he, he could have got this man to take a different plea. But since the, um the guy admitted they were they, once he admitted they were there on the scene at the same time, they both get charged as co-defendants, like the mafia almost. Uh, we had a situation down here where um this guy named Uncle Louis, right here, it says uh grateful. Released despite guilty plea in Florida murder, Uncle Louis returns to New Orleans. He took something called the Alfred plea. A L F A R D. The Alfred plea is um this, where you kind of just admit that you're guilty. Or admit that you did it and that you felt sorry for what you did. Something to that effect. But the um the children of the victim fought on behalf of this guy. We see this dude in New Orleans all the time. He's in the French Quarter tomorrow, I think. Give me a second. Um, where is it at right here? Um, one woman out for a walk with her dog rushed to Miller outside at a convenience store at the 700 block of St. Louis and said, it, it just, I just had to come and get a quick hug. Two other men who approached Miller to shake hands offered up, you look good, man. Great to see you, man. So the point I'm making is, it says more than 70 people contributed a total of nearly six grand to a web page set up to raise money for Miller's defense. He touched so many hearts. This guy killed somebody in 1974. Okay. Yeah, right here. See, their lives were put on a collision course with Miller's on May 22nd, 1974, when a man placed a box of cake mix, a can of frosting, and a soft drink on the counter at the family store in Jacksonville, Florida, pointed a gun at the owner and said, this is a hold up. So, you know, the father of four swatted the gun away and was shot dead. He shot, he actually killed this man in committance of a robbery. But uh, Farah, the son of Robert and his family supported the deal because what they wanted most was for the murder murderer to accept responsibility. So it just goes to show you that there's a, a story of redemption. Okay, the reason why I bring all of this up is the victims of the guy he killed seen what a different life he had outside and figured he was kind of a drug addict. But when they found out that the, that the mayor of New Orleans loved this man so much, then he had to be somebody special. Okay, the Nathaniel Woods situation is completely different. Um, the police officer's daughter fought against this man's execution. They could have sent the right people to the governor to give him life without parole. That would be satisfactory because he was there and he was convicted. That's the one thing nobody wants to keep no one wants to admit that this guy was convicted. I was you know really willing to come to the defense and you know go after the state of Alabama for being racist. But at the end of the day, when the Supreme Court, and I don't know what the fuck their problem was, for giving this man a stay of execution, and then, and then like three hours later denying it. That's some racist shit. The governor probably has something to do with that. Okay? But unfortunately for the people that's watching this video, it's not the state's job to be nice to you. It's not the state's prosecution, I mean, the prosecution's job to be nice to you. It's their job to get convictions. They have evil, twisted-ass people in the prosecutor's office. Okay? So, you know, I'm just lucky that my situation turned out good. I've been out of jail for 20-something years. I'm normal, taxpaying dude, own a house, own three houses, actually, doing well for myself.
the judge gave me a warning. She said, if I ever, if I ever see you again, <laughs> it won't be good. So, you know, I'm kind of like a one-time felon. I can't really, well, I own a gun now, but I had to go through hell to get it. But anyway, guys, that's all. That's my thoughts and my opinions on this, man. I hate that this, you know, that um, the governor didn't call this man in and the ex executioner only did his job. But unfortunately, this is a case where the guy was convicted and unfortunately, people waited to the last minute who don't really know the law. Got everybody, you know, hopes up for no reason. 